I'm Chance Dorland, and in San Antonio, military means local. This is Military City, a podcast from ExpressNews.com. On each episode, San Antonio Express News senior reporter Sig Christensen and I discuss the military stories important to San Antonio both from today and the past. Sig Christensen, of course, was embedded with the 3rd Infantry Division during the U.S.-led invasion of Iraq in 2003 and has reported on military-related topics for decades. Sig, great to have you back here on the program. As always, I'm really excited to talk about today's topic. This is something that uh, this podcast allows us to do. We talk about, um, you know, some of our first episodes were about Iraq, um, something that you were involved with several years ago being embedded there. And of course, there's uh, echoes of that in stories from today. We've also talked about stories that are happening. You know, you're writing them and then coming right here on the podcast and discussing them. And then, then we have great stories from the past that still involve people alive today. Today, like 99 year old Pearl Harbor survivor Virgil Lee Ward, who joined the military out of a small town in Tennessee and started Sunday, December 7th, 1941, as he did most other days, getting up well before dawn and heading over to the post exchange not too far from Diamond Head to pick up the Honolulu Advisor. He had close calls that morning, again in 1950 in Korea, and once more in Vietnam over a career that spanned 30 years that saw him rise from private to major. So that epic journey is the topic of discussion today, Sig, but specifically a focus on what he saw the day America entered into the Second World War. We'll get to that in a moment, but let's start off with uh, how you first became aware of Mr. Virgil Ward. Mm, that's a good question. I actually cannot remember how I learned of him, but when I did, I was very excited because new Pearl Harbor survivors are next to impossible to find. Uh, there is a group here called the Pearl Harbor Survivors Association, like the national organization, it's defunct. Uh, the remnants of it meet every year, as they did today, December 7th, uh, 2018, at a place called the Barn Door Restaurant where they salute the veterans that are still alive. Well, that group had dozens and dozens and dozens of people in it at one time, and now it has four and two showed up. Uh, one who didn't is in a nursing home. His name is Colonel Bill Hayes. And the other fellow is uh, uh, a fellow named Meyer, Gilbert Meyer, and he's at the uh, uh, Pearl Harbor ceremony in Hawaii. Uh, Virgil Lee Ward was never a member of that group. Uh, he has been to one of those events, uh, which is kind of a solemn uh, event where people have a moment of silence at 11.55, which is the time here in San Antonio that the Japanese attack started 77 years ago today. And then they uh, introduced the families and they had seven families here today. Uh, most of the families, loved ones who were there at Pearl Harbor that day are dead, but they still come. And there was one family, uh, generations of them were at the table. So it's, it's something that I hope happens in most towns around the country. It's the sort of thing that would always happen in San Antonio which people call Military City USA for a reason. Uh, it's a place where the military is still revered and loved deeply. And not just because, you know, we thank people for their service, but because this place is full of military retirees. It's full of people who serve at three bases around town. And uh, so there are retirees, there are people who were in the military and left. Uh, this is a, a big, a uh, home for uh, wounded veterans from Iraq and Afghanistan. They were treated at the uh, Brook Army Medical Center complex and uh, ultimately spent a lot of time at the Center for the Intrepid, which is a world-class rehabilitation facility. So there's a lot of military here, and this holiday in particular is really revered amongst uh, a number of people in town. So as we always do with each episode, Sig, we're going to get to some clips of an interview you did with the subject we're discussing today, Virgil Ward. Um, you began by asking him um, basically how his day started. It turns out he had a paper route. Tell me a little bit about that, and then we'll get to the clip. 
Oh, well, you know, Virgil came up from a rough life. He had a he had a poor life. His his dad was a preacher and a moonshiner. <laughs> and and uh Virgil ended up having to do a lot of the chores around the house. Uh this is what he told me one day. He said it was a rough, rough life. I had to get up before daylight and run the cattle in, milk the cattle, feed the chickens, feed all the horses and the cattle. It was getting to be a real strain, and the worst part of it was that I was kept out of school to do some of this work instead of going to school. His dad, uh, since he was freed up from doing those chores, made and delivered 100 proof moonshine. So finally, he decided to join up in the military, and he winds uh, winds up at uh, Honolulu. They sent him out there, and he thinks this is living in high clover uh, or tall cotton or whatever the phrase is, and he's having a great time, but they're only paying him $21 a month. So he starts throwing a paper, a Honolulu advertiser, and he starts making more money every month from throwing that paper route than he does from the military. And that's who that guy is. He's a hardworking guy, and he's still really sharp. Uh, he, he's, he's still walking, uh, and he's in great shape. So there's something to be said for doing lots of chores. I waited. Uh, I was always out there at 630 to, to get my newspapers. I had a paper route to, uh, to uh, kind of... Uh, fill in for the uh, amount of uh, funding, you know, and uh, I was making more money on that than I was in the military. <laughs> At any rate, uh, I look and I see all these, there was 15 aircraft coming in and, and these ships were lined up right beside each other. And all of a sudden they started dropping bombs right down the, the uh, and the ships, and uh, I had a, uh, a telephone exchange in Diamond Head, and uh, I, I decided that the, that the best thing for me to do was to head for that uh, telephone exchange and go to my duty station, which I did. But on the way, it was about a half a mile from there to where my duty station was located. And uh, they were they were then strafing the streets somewhat and and uh, just shooting all over the place, of course. And uh, I went in and went into the exchange and uh, it, it was uh, lit up like a Christmas tree, of course. And um, I took over there, uh, relieved the trooper that was on duty and uh, took over the duties. And I was on duty there for for the next uh, tour. And and that that was my part of little being there. And I I was real close to where they were. And and I got out of there just in time before they were strafing the street that I was on. And uh, there was two generals that called in, wanting to know what was happening. And and I I told them I said the the Japanese planes, because I could see the faces of the the, the of the pilots. So uh, anyway, that, that that was my part of it. So, Sig, today when we're recording this episode, it is the anniversary of what happened back on December 7th, 1941. And that, of course, came up during your interview with Virgil. Uh, What was he doing that day? Virgil Lee Ward that day was uh, getting ready to throw his newspapers, and he gets up before dawn to do that. He goes down to the post exchange, which is about half a mile away from his uh, job, which is at a bunker complex in uh, Diamond Head. The job he has as a signal corpsman is to run a uh, manually operated telephone bank, which at that time was like the state of the art. And not everybody knew how to do it. And, And so he was just getting ready to start his day. And suddenly he sees some planes coming out of the blue. They're little specks and they get bigger. And then he sees a formation of 15 aircraft and they break up. 
and suddenly bombs are dropping on Battleship Row, and all hell is breaking loose. And he now has a decision to make, which is, what do you do? Well, he says, to hell with the newspapers. He's got to get back to his duty station. Uh, but he doesn't take the quick route along the road. He gets away from the road because that's what the Japanese are strafing. And he's not very far away from where those planes are attacking people on the ground. And my recollection is there were something like 68 civilians killed by the Japanese in that battle. And this is exactly how it happens. The Japanese would strafe anything that moved. Uh, so it wasn't simply military targets they were after. And Virgil has to thread his way back to the office uh, through that fire. They were flying in, in, in a formation when they first came in. And then they split up, of course. And uh, they, they were diving in in the area where I was at. And I, and I was was pretty close, but the, I, I got out of that highway in a hurry and, and was all off over in the side. And I, 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 I didn't have to go down the highway to, and they were strafing already when, when I went into the tunnel. Well, it was dark back in there, of course, and then couldn't they have a lighting system? a string of lights uh, to where you could see where you're going. It was back in, quite a ways back in the inside of Diamond Head. And, and it, it was a small switchboard, wasn't a, it was a huge one. And it was manual operated, of course, back in those days. And uh, I'd I stayed right there on my duty station so I got relieved. In the, when the ship, the second second ship, um, all, all of that was all upsetting, of course, you know, and it's just something that, uh, that's something that was happened that never did happen to me before, you know. So as we just heard, um, Virgil saw the Japanese planes. He saw the pilots at one point, knew, knew who they were. Um, and you asked him what that did to his emotional state. What did he have to say? You know, he said he was scared, but uh, it doesn't sound like he was too scared. Um, interesting that he says it that way. I think like a lot of soldiers uh, and sailors and airmen that day, he was trying to stay alive, but he also was really focused on getting to his job and doing his duty doing what he was trained to do. And that's what these, uh, that's what these troops at Pearl Harbor were trying to do. And I think it was evident to them very quickly that this was not going to be a good day for our side. But they were still trying to get into the game. And when you watch the movie From Here to Eternity, uh, you see that the, one of the chief characters in it, Robert E. Lee Pruitt, tries to get back to his uh, duty post uh, after... Uh, the attack, and he's recovering from a knife fight that he has with Ernest Borgnine, who plays a uh, kind of a sadistic character in the movie. And I think they captured that really well. I think a lot of troops at Pearl Harbor, when you talk to them, they all talk about, well, I had to get back to my, my, my post. Uh, that was all I thought about. And Virgil talks about that, and, it's, and, and I've interviewed him on a number of occasions now, and it's the same story every time. So I have no trouble believing it. Uh, I've been writing about these veterans over most of my 35-year career, and I can tell you that his story is a lot like those of almost every other soldier or airman or sailor I talked with over that time. They, they uh, didn't have anybody around to tell them what to do, to issue orders. They acted on their own initiative, which is the American way of fighting, by the way. Some soldiers and some armies don't do that well, but our soldiers tend to do that very well. And that's what they did. And so uh, he doesn't talk about this being heroic, uh, just like Chuck Yeager doesn't talk about his service in World War II or breaking the sound barrier as being heroic. 
Jaeger will tell you, I did it for my country. And that's what Virgil Lee Ward will tell you. And when you talk to any of these other veterans who are still alive and they're all 97, 98, some are 100, that's what they'll tell you. Uh, it's part of what makes them a great generation. And I don't know that I want to say they're the greatest generation because we've got a bunch of great soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines out there today fighting and serving in parts of the world that they've been in for a long time and where the wars had no resolution. And they still go. There was uh, one recently who was killed and he was on his 20th deployment. Now, just think about that for a minute. What kind of person does that? Uh, they keep going back. They keep serving their country. They, they put time away from their family aside to serve their country. That makes them really great. And so they're all heroes to me. It shook me up, of course, and, and uh, not having been in, uh, exposed to any such thing like that, it, it just kind of scared me, of course, you know. But, but I, the first thing I thought of was is go to my duty station. And I, I didn't have any instructions from anybody on anything. I just was by myself. So, Sig, to, to close things out on today's episode, um, I'm wondering, what are your thoughts on the fact that, you know, our two biggest foes from World War II are, are some of our strongest allies. I, I've lived in Germany. I've lived in Asia, not in Japan, but I've lived close to Japan. Boy, I mean, what a turnaround, but it's not a surprise, of course. I mean, like, you know, our largest amount of forces abroad are are in those two areas. Um, what do you think about the transition that happened after World War II that led us to where to where we are today? Well, it's funny. President Roosevelt called it a day of infamy. 21 American ships hit. Uh, eight battleships sunk or damaged. The USS Arizona, USS Oklahoma, and USS Utah were complete losses. We lost 169 airplanes. We had 2,335 service members killed. 1,143 wounded. 29 Japanese aircraft were lost. It was a smashing success on their part. But when you take a look at that battle, it not only was the, the, a victory that ended up leading to them losing a war, but it actually recreated the entire world order. So enemies, Germany and Japan, and Germany had been our enemy in World War II, one and and Japan was our enemy in the Second World War. They become two of our most steadfast allies, and they become the beating heart of Western democracy that I grew up in uh, in the '60s. So we used to have Japanese transistor radios. Nobody knows what those are now, but we had transistor radios, and they were made in Japan. And it was always a joke about everything being made in Japan. But Japan became a powerhouse. Uh, I remember when. Uh, their their first cars were selling in the United States. And now I drive a Toyota Camry hybrid. And I have a Toyota uh, Sequoia from 2004. That's turned out to be the best car I've ever had. Almost no problems over 14 years of ownership. So it's weird because... Yes, we won the war, but we won something a lot more important. Uh, and it started on this day. We won the world. We, we created a, a order that spread peace and prosperity. We won a world where, for the first time, there were no generational wars taking place in Europe. Uh, the first one that came after World War II was the breakup of Yugoslavia. Uh, that is an exception to the rule that we've established since VJ Day. So when you take a look at what happened, uh, it's really an extraordinary thing that from this moment at 7.55 a.m. Hawaii time, 11.55 
a.m. Central Time. This is the clock that starts to run on the world, and it transforms this war. It transforms the world. And I don't know about anyone else, but I really value what we did with this war at the end of it. We rebuilt Germany. We rebuilt Japan. We stepped in and saved Korea from becoming uh, a place of darkness for for decades. Uh, So half of Korea uh, has become extraordinarily prosperous. The people are free. And they're building cars that we're buying in large numbers here in the United States. So our influence and and our capacity for doing good uh, is seems to be pretty limitless. And it starts at 7.55 a.m. Pacific time. And so uh, I'm really proud of this. And this generation, these old guys that are 97 years old that I was with today, uh, if they're still able to think, and and some of them are not having a uh, doing well in terms of their cognitive capacities anymore, but if they are able to think about what they did to help change the world, they should feel to feel immense pride. And in all the troops and all the civilians who lived from that time on until now, we all should feel great pride in in what happened to the world. Because while there's still a lot of trouble. We changed things for the better, and it started with the first bomb that fell on the first ship in that harbor. It's 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 a subject that you could sit there and have drinks and talk talk about for hours because philosophically, uh, it's it's just an extraordinary shift in the dynamic of our of our planet, and maybe it's what really makes the change for us, and we become a much more uh, sane and ordered planet in the long run. But that's where it started. And, and I'm really amazed to be a part of it, to be interviewing those guys and, and to just bring you, uh, even for 15 or 20 minutes, a chance to listen to one of them talk about his day of battle.